All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Department of Pediatrics Grand Rounds. Special welcome to the folks that are here in person getting their breakfast um, and to the folks on Zoom. So my name is Mary Leonard, I'm chair of the department. And I just wanna do a little bit of uh, some housekeeping before we introduce today's Grand Round speaker. So as always, you can see on the slide the information necessary for your MOC part two and your CME credit. And then looking ahead, we always wanna make sure everybody is aware of some of the upcoming speakers. Next week is a very special event. This is something we instituted a few years ago with the Chief Quality Officer, and this is our Quality Improvement Series. So Grace Lee, who is our Chief Quality Officer, as well as other faculty um, and staff across a couple of different disciplines are gonna talk about learning from events to develop a proactive safety culture. So a really important topic, and we look forward to that event. And then the following week, we are very fortunate that Amanda Williams is going to come talk to us about the U.S. maternal mortality crisis through a health equity lens. And then just very briefly, I hope folks know about CMQCC and CPQCC, the California Maternal and Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative here uh, run out of Stanford, which what with a very deep engagement with our community, which has done just spectacular work on reducing maternal mortality. Yoke and Profit came and gave grand rounds a few months ago about some of the perinatal work. And then Amanda Williams, who is the clinical innovation advisor for CMQCC and adjunct faculty in the School of Medicine here in the department of OBGYN is gonna be talking to us about this topic here, a very important topic in our with our partnership with OBGYN. So good upcoming events. And then uh, we'll have our university land acknowledgement shown here as always and the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. And then wanna make sure everyone is aware that we are right now in the throes of getting our mentors for PIPS, this pediatric internship program. I hope people are all aware of this. It is such a joyous uh, event when we bring these uh, URM first generation low income high school students from the across the entire Bay Area into our summer program. Uh, I talked, you know, Allison who runs this program beautifully, I think within a week of opening it, they, the website, they had already had like 500 applications from high school students. So this has got an incredible amount of momentum and we really need faculty mentors. Uh, it's such a fun program. So please uh, consider learning more about the program. If you have any questions, you can email Alice and Garen directly. Um, we're really proud of this program. It's quite innovative, unlike anything in the entire School of Medicine, because the curriculum for the students is much more than just the research, but they actually even work with the families around issues of college applications, financial aid. It's it's quite quite wonderful. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite David Lewis, Chief of Allergy, Immunology, and Rheumatology, to introduce today's grand round speaker. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mary. Um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Elena Say to give uh, pediatric grand rounds. Um, uh, Elena is in the Department of Pediatrics and Micro, Micro and Immunology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And um, after uh, doing her uh, medical school training at UCSF, uh, followed by a UCLA Peace Residency, I first got to know Elena when she, um, we had uh, matched her for our fellowship in allergy immunology, and she was clearly the most dedicated person that I've ever seen prior to even um, physically uh, starting the fellowship. Uh, she pursued a pediatric scientist training program um, uh, application, which was successful. And I really think she has been the example of what that training can do. She has gone on after completing her fellowship to really from scratch develop a um, primary immunodeficiency and immune dysregulation uh, program at the University of Colorado, um, become a very important mentor uh, for the graduate students, including uh, one of our current pediatric residents, uh, Isabel Fernandez, who's an MD, PhD, and uh, has really developed a special uh, research uh, program that has a very um, mechanistic but translational bent. And I think you'll really get a good flavor of that today with her talk, which is entitled From Mechanisms of Rare Inborn Errors of Immunity to Precision Medicine in Pediatric Inflammatory Bowel Disease. So, Elena. 
I am behind you. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, first, thank you everybody for coming. I know it's early in the morning and thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, it feels really special for me to give Fran Rounds kind of back to quote the place or raise me. So uh, thank you. Um, so I'll talk today about a couple of stories that was kind of worked um, in the lab that are probably, you know, a lot of things uh, familiar to um, research areas that many of you here in the audience pursue. Um, and if there are any questions, I know there's a Q&A at the end, but also feel free to interrupt me. I think that kind of makes it fun, so don't be shy about doing that. Um, uh, so I'll start. Uh, uh, so I'll start off with, you know, I realize some of this is kind of obvious to many of you in the audience, but I think when people think about primary immune deficiency, right, the word is called immune deficiency, so that I think people think about infections. But really, I think um, with time, uh, we have learned that many of the primary manifestations of our patients that have inborn areas of immunity actually is not infection. It's not the first thing that we see. In fact, is autoimmunity and autoinflammation. Um, and this really has, I think, expanded uh, where our patients are seen are in care for and the impact that we can have as immunologists, not just in the clinical care, but in the work that we do. Um, so if you think about sort of the trifecta of the different presentations and manifestations uh, in our patients, we tend to see infections, autoinflammation, autoimmunity um, for the infections. You know, this is the very classic PIDD. Uh, we now have this category. I think people like to take inborn areas of immunity and make it into the bipartite PIDD, PIRD type of dichotomy. I think calling it IEI is probably kind of a fair representation of all disorders of the patients we take care of, including that some of them, you know, we share a lot of patients with rheumatology. Uh, we also take care of a lot of patients that have really severe A2P, and some of those patients have inborn areas of immunity as well. And um, some of the challenges I think that we experience um, in the research and the clinical sides is that uh, when the, our patients uh, have autoinflammation, autoimmunity, uh, or atopy, they are often immunomodulated in the context of treatment for management. So then they come to you and, you know, there's a lot that has happened to them already in the context of manipulation of the immune system. And they were asked the question of like, well, how do you think we should treat the patient? Uh, and it makes it really hard to evaluate at the clinical level, but also kind of dissect the mechanism at the research side. Uh, and we, the nice thing is uh, we have genetics to help us, and that's usually the starting point for a lot of us. And hopefully I'll kind of show you uh, how we've um, done that in my lab. And many of you also do that um, in terms of arriving to the understanding of the disease. And the thrust, I think, as to why we want to do this is one from a scientific standpoint, because we believe that understanding errors of immunity helps us understand really immunology. Uh, but as we've learned over time, um, it gets, you know, it used to be the sort of one gene, one disease sort of paradigm. And then we now with uh, sequencing being so uh, commonly done and also in clinical practice, uh, we've learned a lot and seen that we can see the different mutations within one gene with different clinical phenotypes, depending where the mutation is. Uh, it could be gain of function, loss of function. Uh, it could be dominant. Um, and then we also see that patients with the same clinical phenotype, the etiology may be due to mutations in different genes. So I think um, as we walk along sort of this paradigm, the reason why we want to do this and understand it at the molecular level is so that we can get to identifying the pathway that we want to target um, so we can sort of follow the principle of precision medicine, right? Which if you actually look up on Wikipedia precision medicine, it says it's sometimes known as personalized medicine and it's an innovative approach for tailoring disease prevention and treatment, takes into account differences in people's genes, environments and lifestyles. So this is kind of when we think about the interaction of um, our genetics and our environment and post-translation modifications. And really, I think for me as a physician scientist, I think about this, that precision uh, medicine means that we actually give the right treatment, but to the right patient at the right time. And that, I think, is where we find the most um, challenging piece, at least I do, that oftentimes when the patient comes to you is no longer the right time. So even if you have the precise treatment, you might have missed the right time uh, window. And in that sort of setting, I think we have to kind of um, modify our mindset and say that, well, I might have found the pathway, but I actually need to uh, first treat the symptoms, then kind of come back to the etiology, but it does not make the time that we invest in understanding the mechanism not valid. 
think at the end, you can sort of use that to come back to the patient. And that's the model that I think many of us try to follow. Um, so I'll tell you two stories that are kind of close and dear to my heart, um, where uh, I think autoinflammation, autoimmunity is really the main uh, manifestation. So this actually started with a story where two physicians from Ulm University in Germany, uh, it was a little far for us, uh, you know, uh, they reached out to us and they said, well, we have a family with two siblings um, that have a presentation of recurrent infections in infancy, infancy and also failure to thrive. That's a very common referral that we get. Um, we get consulted about this in the inpatient. Um, so uh, you can see the family uh, here. Um, so this family was seen in uh, Alm University in Germany, but they actually are from Saudi Arabia. They immigrated. Um, and uh, the first, the proband had recurrent infections since infancy, also some uh, pulmonary um, issues that require a fairly aggressive treatment. And it's a mixture of, well, there were a lot of infections and there were lots of infection, inflammation as well. Um, and same thing with the gut. And then there were two other siblings who were unaffected. Here, I'm kind of listing the different complications that they had. Viral infections and fungal infections are at the top. Um, and then in a very, you know, a couple of things that were interesting to me is that these children were vaccinated. They did receive actually live viral vaccines um, and uh, they tolerated those. So when we get a little closer look into the clinical um, workup that they did, uh, they do do newborn screen there. Um, so these children fail newborn screen, TREX of zero. They also do CREX, and you can see that they did have some B cells. When they did a flow, uh, peripheral flow to look at TBNK, uh, there's clear lymphopenia, particularly in the T cells. Um, and then you can see that for the few T cells that are there, uh, they're skewed towards a memory phenotype. And recall that I said that they tolerated live vaccines. So then they did a T cell proliferation assay and they have a response to PHA decreased but not absent. Um, and then they also have used an anti-TCR-CD3 anti -CD3, C28 to engage TCR response also low, not absent. Um, but really when it comes to antigen is very, very poor. So there's some proliferation capacity, but it appears to have trouble with antigen. When you look at the B cells, they're there, they seem to isotype switch, but uh, really not very well. Um, and then this also makes sense in the context of the hypogammaglobulinemia that they had and they were on IVIG supplementation. So the, um, they did genetics um, in Germany and then they uh, identified that there was a, a, a mutation um, that led to the substitution of a proline to the serine um, and the amino acid 440. This is located in the catalytic domain of LCK. Um, and when the investigators reached out to us, it was actually very interestingly, one single publication on an LCK deficiency, uh, also published by a German group uh, that was located also in the catalytic domain. And this is a leucine to a proline at position 341. Very interestingly, and you know, this come back at the end, we, are, we uh, published our mutation in November and actually kind of right around that time, there are the two additional LCK mutations that have come out. So in total, thus far, as far as I know, there are four now current mutations that have been published pathogenic. Um, but at the time when we were working on this, there was this one other one um, that was published. So uh, if you, um, so LCK is very uh, tightly regulated. Um, and it's very dependent on its conformation. Within it, it of itself, it has an inhibitory uh, phosphorylation unit at 505, and then it has also a activating subunit. Um, and uh, it, it has a autoregulation that is very dependent on the conformation. So tyrosine 394 is the activating, and then tyrosine 505 is inhibitory. You actually have to be in an open conformation for tyrosine um, 394 to be phosphorylated. And where the mutation is located, it actually does significantly alter the open conformation. Um, and this was all done by in silico prediction with a group in Georgia Tech. And really, uh, when they did the different simulations, you can look at the stability of the areas around the residue. Um, and then you can see that our mutation is around 440. So then in the multiple simulation runs, you can see that it's quite unstable for the mutant. Um, then when you then um, upstream, sorry, so our mutation um, is 440 here, and you can see the 394, which is the activating uh, residue, also is fairly unstable suggesting that this mutation does affect um, the access 
to this residue and it affects how it changes conformationally speaking, which is quite important for the function. Um, so that gave us a clue. Also, when you have um, alterations to the conformation um, of the protein, that leads to instability of the protein. So then we said, well, that's something that we can test whether that actually is true, because this was all in silico prediction. So then when we did the study, uh, you can add cyclohexamide. So we use the cell line when we put the mutation LCK, we have a cell line. So this is a jerkut cell line that uh, LCK is already knocked out. So it was convenient that that's available. It's called JCAM. So you can buy that, that's the LCK knockout. Then we can actually take that and we can put in our um, mutation and overexpress it via vector. And then you can also put um, LCK wild type in. So then when you use the, uh, when you use those cell lines and you compare um, what the protein uh, degradation is like by adding cyclohexamide, so you're not inducing new translation and you're just simply looking at what happens to the protein over time, you can see that the mutant has significant increased um, degradation and there's, uh, that's related to sort of the protein stability that was predicted in silico. So having a actual bench experiment that can uh, validate the in silico findings that we saw. Um, and you can see this is, it, this is the Western of well, the cell line incubated cyclohexamide, and then you sort of assess the protein at different time points. So now that we know, okay, we think this mutation affects this domain that affects the conformation, that affects the protein stability, we think there's decreased expression, you can test that by flow. Um, so we have a flow antibody against LCK, um, and you can see here, this all the work that I'm presenting on LCK was done by graduate student Victor, who I graduated. He was my he's my first baby that I graduated a couple of weeks ago, which was really all emotional in different ways. Um, I have another baby that we I graduated also here, so um, it's a, I'm a very proud mama. So uh, I think when you look at LCK expression, it makes sense to look at T cells. So we look at CD4 and CD8. You would predict that actually affects the CD4s more than the 8s because LCK actually interacts with CD4 directly. Uh, so that is actually what we saw. Um, and we were very lucky that when we discussed with the German colleagues, we said, you know, um, when you look at TCR signal transduction, uh, we know that LCK and CD3, Z8, and SAP70 are closely related. So it would be great. We actually had quote, a disease control sample where we could actually assess LCK expression and function um, in patients that have such proximal defects. And very luckily for us, they also had PBNCs from a patient with SAP70 deficiency. Um, so you can see here that we have healthy patients, uh, the patient with the LCK mutation and SAP70. And in that scenario, you have normal expression of LCK as you should expect in your SAP70 patient as you're doing healthy. This is where the isotype control is. And you can see where our patients line for CD4 and CD8 expression. Um, and then um, because, as I mentioned, LCK, and I'll show you the picture here, uh, that LCK actually very closely interacts with CD4, the mutation LCK not only leads to decreased LCK expression, but it also leads to decreased CD4 expression. And that's definitely seen, um, we did assess this in the parents, they are heterozygotes, and for our mutation, we did not see decrease of LCK. Um, this was not true for two of the other mutations that have been published. Um, and then when it comes to CD8, there also is some decreased expression, but really not as dramatic. Um, and um, this is the picture here to kind of remind you how uh, the, the different receptors are engaged. Uh, so you have CD4 and you have LCK here. Uh, as I mentioned, LCK is auto-regulated with a 394 as an um, tyrosine that it's the activating 505 in inhibitory. It also interacts with CSK. CSK inhibits the activation. LCK CD45 promotes its activation. Um, and then you can see when all the conditions are right, there is an autophosphorylation that happens. And then that uh, phosphorylase gap 70, you have TCR signaling that happens downstream. So um, we, uh, we use Cytoff as many uh, people use in this campus with the milling machines available. Um, and um, we had the opportunity to assess multiple different T cell subsets and B cell subsets, and then look at really signaling downstream of TCR signaling. Um, and, you can, and I circle here the phosphor proteins that we assess. We did simulation of the patient samples with anti-CD3 C28 to engage T cell. We also did um, fat prime dimers for IgM and IgG for the B cells. Um, and then what you see here, if you look at the CD4 T cells, uh, you really have significant um, 
trouble engaging, really leading to phosphorylation of anything downstream of LCK. But actually, as you start going more and more downstream, you start getting some phosphorylation of those proteins. So when you're anything that you're assessing that's actually very close here to LCK, it's significantly decreased, as you can see. As you start going down the pathway, then you're able to detect some signaling. I think the question here is that it's very challenging to say, well, is this directly that there's some signaling left or are you getting some amplification that happens because as you go more downstream, the more and more different pathways are feeding to that, is there some compensation? Um, so how, and then the other thing that we have here is in the patient, you have decreased protein. So when you have decreased function, which is TCR signal transduction, that's either because you have decreased protein or because you have decreased function of both, right? Is the remaining protein that you have actually working at all? That's really hard to answer in the patient, but you can do that in a cell line because that can normalize the protein expression of the mutant to the protein expression of the wild type. So they're both expressing the same amount of protein and then I assess function. So I get to sort of be in even plane and assess apples to apples. So that's what we did. We kind of um, made the cell lines in the way I described. And the first thing is you have to, um, we did uh, have a GFP readout for assessing um, amount of LCK expression so that you can sort based on GFP. So then you're sorting the same amount of LCK expression for the wild type and the mutant. So now I said, okay, now they're expressing the same amount of LCK, then um, you can, assess TCR signal transduction. We did calcium flux, and it's really hard to thing that you see. Um, and then we also did a phosphotyrosine blot. These are the different time points uh, post anti-CD3, CD4, and there's also CD28 in their um, stimulation. And when you compare the wild type versus the mutant, it's really night and day. And I think really more um, uh, striking is that, well, when I compare it to the empty vector, so this cell line that has no LCK, it appears that you know things look very similar. So really, are we doing with a mutation that is in null mutation, or is there anything left in terms of function? Because if you recall in the Cytof data that I showed, as you go downstream, there's some phospho uh, signaling or, or a phosphorylation of signaling proteins that we can see. So uh, you know, is is this the question? And um, the LCK knockout has been heavily studied. The mouse model has existed since the early 1990s. So really, this is the time where Victor is in his like third year of grad school. So like maybe it's been one year in my lab and he's like, oh, my God, I'm just studying something that has already been studied since the early 1990s. Um, I am. This is the moment where you sit down and you have therapy with your graduate student because you're like, what do I do now? Did you start a new project? Um, but this is the thing, right, that the data that we've seen in the cell line is that, a cell line. You don't have, you know, for LCK, it actually is very important for confirmation of changes to have all the core receptors. If you don't know, when you look at the JCAM expression of CD4, CD8, um, and everything that you need, it, it's actually really not quite like a live system, and the human is a whole beam. So, what if we at least had a mouse model, you know, because there's a knockout mouse. So if we could put our mutation in a mouse and compare our mouse with our mutation with a knockout, that would be a lot more informative. Um, so we worked, uh, we're lucky to have a mouse genetics facility. So we work with them to uh, CRISPR in this mutation. Um, it was, it, it's, you know, a single amino acid change is actually really quite hard to achieve. Uh, so after a lot of work and a couple of rounds and a lot of money, uh, we got to make this mouse. There was this one male that propagated the colony. Um, and I think really the, the, the biggest moment is when you're, you're waiting to really see the phenotype of this mouse, right? Because you spend the money and you're like, well, I hope this works. Um, and uh, I think this is the moment where I, both of our blood pressures lowered uh, when you look at the knockout um, and then you say, okay, so you as a knockout mouse, you have lymphopenia. That makes sense. LCK is important for T cell development. So you have very, very few T cells. But this knockout mouse had just, quote, the immune deficiency. I mean, they live in an SPF facility, so there's that. But um, other than that, the mouse was teeny tiny and um, relatively sort of not as teeny tiny as this mouse. This mouse, had diarrhea very early on, had really significant trouble. Uh, we had to give it this sort of kind of special, very expensive food for it to grow. Um, had splenomegaly and T-cell lymphopenia, very much like our human. 
Um, so at this point, you start sort of saying, okay, this mouse model is a good representation of my human, and in fact, looks different from my knockout, which tells me that this mutation is not quite a null. It has to be something different, which we like to call hypomorph. So um, starting then from asking the question of what's different between the knockout and then our mutant, um, you start looking at protein expression. Is there something there? I realize you have to squint a little for that band, but you know it's, it's a little bit there versus the knockout, and this is the ratio of decrease versus the wild type. Then um, most strikingly in the gut, right? That was the main phenotype that we saw with the failure to thrive and the diarrhea. Um, I think when you do the gross anatomy and when you do the histology is very, very clear. Uh, this is the uh, gut of the wild type. This is the knockout, looks very much like the wild type. And then this is our mutant. Um, and you can, you know, for anybody that's um, on the call or here that's GI, I think this is not hard to see that that looks like it's inflamed. When you look at histology, there's some of the classical features. So you can take the entire intestine and sort of do what I call the Swiss roll. Um, and normally this should look, the wall is very nice and thin, um, which is really how the wild type and the knockout look. Um, and then you can see the hyperplasia here in our mutant. Um, and then you can do all the multiple measures that, um, to assess the degree of severity of disease. So in terms of the, uh, the failure to thrive, our mouse is very small. Um, you can assess colonic swelling and that's significant. You can look at the crypt lens, that's also very different. Um, you can look at the lymphoid aggregates. There are many of them. Um, and we also work with a pathologist, Paul Jetlika, and we ask him to do a his surpass scoring and we blinded him to like who was who. Um, and it's very clear that really only our mutants have a really high histopath score. Um, and then when we also did immunofluorescence, um, so we uh, work with the Akoya instruments, you can do nine colors plus DAPI, um, and you can look at staining, there's a fair amount of T cells. So it's very interesting, right, where, you know, this mouse is very, very T cell lymphopinic, yet the gut is housing a lot of T cells in there, but a lot of B cells as well. So you got few T cells, they're mostly in the skewed memory phenotype and they are all apparently went to the gut. So let's start asking questions there. So if you then take the gut of the mouse with, that is mutant versus the NACA, you can assess um, the cytokine production um, by either intracellular staining or you can basically cook uh, the, um, the digested tissue with media and look at the supernatant. Um, and it's very clear to see that there's overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines um, in our mutant mouse, um, several of them. And then when we also did a call of the gut to basically look at the um, intestinal um, IL, uh, the uh, intestinal lymphocytes, and then you can see when you look at the breakdown of really who are the cells that are making TNF interfering gamma IL-17. Um, so I think it's very clear that really uh, you have IL-17 production, the mutant, not the NACA and not the wild type, and the cells that are making it are CD3 positive, but they're actually double negative. We did get asked a lot of questions whether we dissected this further, um, and we can we didn't put that in the paper, but we have some data there. Um, and I think this is um, again for sort of GI people on this call. I think when you think about you know biologics that are used for IBD, SLR right is one of them. That's until twenty IL2317. Um, and I think this makes some sense. So this fits with the path of physiology of kind of what IBD will be like in a human. Um, so then let's come back to, okay, so this mouse has the gut disease, has growth issues. What's different at the level of the T cell development? So when you look at T cell development, um, it should be no surprise that, you know, T cell development in the thymus, these are all the different stages as to kind of how T cell thymus development occurs. Um, and uh, this is what they call the bird or the airplane, however you want to see it, uh, the CD4 versus CD8. Um, and you can see that that's clearly distorted, particularly for the population that's here, um, uh, double negative for CD4 um, and CD8s. Um, it's, and then the thymus is also teeny tiny for both of these mouse models. Um, if you take the double negatives and then you do the DN123 bisection, uh, the quadrant from CD4, 25 versus 44, um, you can then see that there's a very clear arrest and maturation at the level of the stage of DN3, right? You're essentially kind of um, stuck in this uh, stage per se. You can't come all the way over to DN4, and you can see that by either relative percentage and absolute counts as well. 
Um, then further into the development of T cells in the thymus, then uh, the T cells have to be selected and then selection is based on TCR signaling strength. So if you can quote, hear the signal well, you're not gonna be selected properly. And selection is important for your conventional T cells, but for your regulatory T cells as well. One way in that you can assess once the T cells have been selected, um, you actually have a double expression for tempor temporary of CD69 and TCR, TCR beta. And you can see that that is not occurring for either the knockout or the mute, right? So, so far, the knockout and the mute in the phimus are looking similar, okay? So, we're not identifying differences there. When you look at the Tregs in the phimus, these are the NT regs, also hardly anything to be found. Same thing, knockout and mute. So, thus far, they're coming along looking very similar. Now, we're going to come out and look in the periphery. Once they leave the phimus and they go into the periphery, this is actually when we start seeing some differences, where, as you recall in the patients, there was a skewing towards the memory phenotype of the T cells in the effector memory um, compartment. Uh, we see that also happening uh, very clearly in our mutant mouse. Um, you can see here, that's like really, most of the cells are in that effect, uh, effector phenotype. Um, but then you do see that for the knockout some too, but not as much as the mutant. And then you can see that by absolute counts, as well as by relative percentages. The very interesting part is, okay, so in the thymus, neither of the mice have very many T cells. Uh, they don't do well in selection or along the development. They're stuck in DN3. You don't make a lot of T rigs, but once, however, whichever T cells leave the thymus, they clearly in the periphery, the ones from the mutant, get enough signals to kind of differentiate into memory phenotype. Um, and very interestingly, if you look at the mesenterine lymph node, which is a draining lymph node of the gut, um, and then you look at the cellularity of that lymph node, which the lymph node holds mostly T cells and B cells, it's a lot larger in the mutant than it is, is actually in terms of cell number, than it is in the knockout. And then when you look at T regs and you look at the percentage, okay, so this is percentage. If you look at absolute numbers, they're still low. But in the mesenterine lymph node, which is the draining living of the gut, you actually have more T rigs in there in the mutant that you have in the knockout. Um, by absolute numbers, you still have decrease. But there's now this idea that if you start looking at the ratio of TM versus T reg, so you would presume that if your ratio of TM over T reg is higher, then you have kind of more effectors if they're functional, right? If they're functional, if, if the T cells are functional on both sides, effector and regulatory, and you have a ratio that's higher, that's the mouse that should have more lymphocytic infiltration. <clears throat> However, that's not what we see, right? The knockout doesn't have that, the mutant does. So then he tells you something about the functionality of these cells. In the knockout scenario, our hypothesis is that you can't hear any signal at all, you're null. So neither your effector nor your regulatory function works. So it's null over null. If you are a P440S mutant, you get enough signal to get some of the effectors to have function, but you don't have enough signal to get regulatory function. So then you kind of have that sort of infiltration that happens. Um, and this is kind of a picture of the hypothesis that if you think about signal strength, a normal selection, um, this is kind of what should happen in terms of who dies, who is clonally deleted. In the setting of hypomorph, everything is shifted. So you have failed T reg development, which I already showed you, um, and probably failed T reg function, which I'll show you the data for that as well. But in the null, you have nothing over nothing. So um, how can we ask that question? Let's ask about T cell proliferation. So you can harvest the cell, uh, T cells from the knockout as well as the mutant. And then you can look at the proliferative capacity and you see what it looks like in the wild type. And then this is the knockout. They're just not proliferating very much. So that kind of sense of nothing over nothing, right? Nothing is working. Uh, but then when you look at the mutant, there's actually some proliferation there. Um, and we also did assess the T-Rex suppressive capacity. Um, and these are uh, very senior assays. We did this in vitro. I would have loved to do this in an in vivo system by doing sort of cell transfers into our mouse models. I think the amount of mice we would need for that, it was really very challenging. So we did the next spec thing, which is an in vitro function where you're mixing the conventional T cells with T rigs at different ratios. And then you look at the suppression of the proliferation capacity. 
So you can see that in the wild type setting, when you put wild type T-Rex, you really compare that versus no T-Rex. You suppress the proliferation of the conventional T-cells. When you do that with either the knockout or the mutant T-Rex, you're really not getting suppression. So then when you put the two pieces of data together, you said you can suppress with the T-Rex in either scenario, wild type or mutant, uh, sorry, knockout or mutant, but then with the proliferation of the effector cells, you do get more proliferation of the mutant. Suggesting again, you have kind of that uneven ratio because the requirement for signaling strength for the different cell types and their function is different. So what happens if you take out the T cells to kind of sort of prove a principle that the gut disease is all T cell mediated? Uh, well, then uh, you do the very fun experiment of doing injections every week, it's lovely. Um, and then you assess and make sure you've got no T cells in the periphery. And then we also make sure that we got no T cells um, in the gut so that your depletion is effective. Um, and then when you do that, you actually can prevent this gut disease from happening. So I think I use the word prevent here because we started doing that depletion before we actually um, got to uh, the mice start really significantly dropping out around 10 weeks. Um, so we started doing these injections before that. Um, and you can see that a lot of the metrics of the inflammation do normalize. Same thing for the cytokine measurements as well. Um, and then, you know, to, um, to the idea that we saw that there's a defect in T-reg function, what if you put wild type T-regs? Um, so we did that with the mice as well, not deplete all the T-cells, but leave the mutant T-cells and just give some wild type T-regs. And then when we did that, you also can actually alter the gut disease. Um, and you can see that a lot of the metrics do normalize as well, and as well as the cytokines. So this is kind of the model and the hypothesis of like how we understand the mechanism of this mutation is that um, I think hopefully you've seen based on the data, the mutation is different from the null. Um, it's, we call it hypomorphic as in decreased expression, but also the function is altered, right? And the function is independently altered regardless of expression, two different issues. And we've shown that by the cell line. We've shown that with the mouse. Um, we show that those very few T cells you got, they're likely oligoclonal. You can ask me about TCR repertoire, I'll answer, it's, it's complicated. But, but it should be no surprise to anybody that these T cells are oligoclonal, right? You come out, you're, you're in an environment, um, and then um, you probably encounter a, a gut microbe antigen, you sort of get reactivity, you get migration into the gut, um, and then voila, you got colitis happening. Um, and this is kind of what I call, this is the virtual cycle that we all try to do here. You, you, you sort of try, you know, you start with a patient in your office that is a total enigma or really many times in a hospital bed, right? That's how we see our patients. Um, you do the genetics, but really it's on us when you get a VUS. And I think this is a challenging issue in this day of NIH funding. Okay, I have this VUS, I need to find out whether this is the real deal um, and I need to assess What's the effect on protein expression? What's the effect of function? What about the rest of the immune system? What's the mechanism? And while you're doing that, the patient is right there, not doing well, right? I think those are the challenges I think that a lot of us experience in this room. This is kind of how I like to call the cycle of discovery, but it does in the end pay off. Like I say, at that time, you might have missed the window, right? Like you're like, I got my pathway, but you might have missed the window, right? The patient is really, you, you might need to transplant at that point. There's nothing. I won't say there's nothing precise about transplant, no offense to the transplanters here, but you know, you're replacing everything, right? So, so even when you find the pathway, you have to make very practical decisions of treating the patient and choosing what to do at that moment to then once you've gotten them somewhat stable, you can start thinking about sort of these targeted therapies because now you know. So um, I like to think that's how, what, you know, we tried to do. So this is kind of what um, we, the story that I presented is what we published and Victor did um, in November. And I think the day we found out that we got accepted was actually the day that the both of us were at the 112th year Taiwanese Independence Day celebration. So I feel the Venn diagram of people that got those two sort of news the same day is very small. Uh, there was an N of two there. Uh, and uh, we, uh, our uh, work got chosen to be in the cover of JAM. Um, the, they changed actually the colors of our original image. It's purple. It wasn't actually driven by me, just so you know. Um, um, but I was very happy with that color in the end. So how, how am I doing on time? Okay. 
So uh, I'll just say that this cycle is kind of, I think, what we aim to do in my lab studying inborn errors of immunity. You, you, uh, it takes really one graduate student, one postdoc life, right, to kind of get through all of this. So it's definitely not uh, insignificant. Um, but uh, we, we also uh, have worked on uh, this sort of type of uh, pipeline for IL-2 receptor beta, which we also published um, in JAM, and you have the first author sitting right here. So ask her any question you want, um, but I want to sort of get to a point uh, where I want to show you something um, that actually, I, I'm going to skip over this story. I didn't think I was going to have time, but I wanted to show you something uh, that is, I think, this idea of coming back to the patient. So this patient had IL-2 receptor beta patient. I have a less finger on the pulse for the patient from Germany because they're in Germany. So I'll tell you the highlights is there's the IL-2 receptor beta hypomorphic defect that we identified. That leads to problems in T cells, including Tregs, my favorite cells. Um, so then when you think about that, we have a same situation where it's not zero signal, but it's a little trickle signal. So you get a little trickle signal, you get a lot of effector cells, they go into tissues where they create problems, including the gut. So now then, you know, the patients get transplanted. So you have this notion and this, this understanding that we went on to do mouse models, and then we went on to do bone marrow chimera and our mouse model work, where you're actually putting different ratios of healthy cells into a mutant animal and you, and you titrate the ratios. The long story of it is that when you can control the cytokine environment, um, of the animal, also of the human, um, actually those cells heavily influence your signaling pathway, right? So if you have a defect in cytokine signaling, but you have a little bit of signaling, the ratio of ligand to receptor is critical. So if you can control some of the quantity of the ligand, you may control some of the quantity of the signaling. And we only understood that because we actually went through the whole story did a lot of work in the mouse model. And this is where in the patient, they transplanted the patient and the chimerism, right, that the engraftment was abysmal, starting completely dropping. Um, and then at this point, all alarms are sounding. And then I think the patient, there's a lot of discussion care conference to try to boost this patient again. So, um, but by this point, you know, we're discussing having to do a second boost, having to do a second transplant in a child who actually is growing and thriving and now no TPN dependence. So we come back to the biology and we say, well, what we understand in the biology is that there's some signaling left and that if I control the environment and if the measurement of cytokines are normal in the environment, I can actually control that signaling level to keep the cells healthy. So this patient have very, very few host Tregs. We counted them in many ways um, when they underwent transplant. We transplanted the patient, a lot of the donor, right? So you do the chimerism study and then you, you look at the donor Tregs and it's about 66%. That kind of quasi, you know, makes sense with your 66% of total T cells. That <clears throat> the host is 34, that's regular math. The cytokine levels of IL-2 and IL-15, the circulation are normal. But then when you do all the math behind it and you do flow cytometry many times and you look at absolute numbers, despite you having less percentage relative of host T-cells, T-regs, you actually have more of them and they actually were more functional. So this kind of told us that, you know, if we can control that, actually, you know, why don't we just hold off on the boost? It doesn't mean we'll never do that, right? I tell this to the transplanters. But it means that there's data right now, and we understand the mechanism enough to say there's a reason for holding off. Um, so he is now, I think, like close to three years post transplants, comes to offer me goldfish when he was like TPN dependent, which is really, really cute. So I'll end with saying, why do we care about rare disease? So we, you get what, one patient, two patients? We care because I think we can broaden our understanding to really more common disorders. So the two cases I showed you, right, May manifestation is a very severe type of colliders or the VEOIBD, very early onset IBD. We get those consults a lot. Um, and I think if we investigate these monogenic uh, etiologies, we can get to pathway-specific therapies. So this is kind of something that um, actually my colleague here, Joseph, and I kind of worked on wrote together that if you do deep profiling at the periphery and at the tissue, and then you do the genetics, you actually can get somewhere that you can use your tissue information to be able to help your patient. Nowadays, we can do multi-parameter studies on tissue as well as we do in peripheral blood. So I'll end with saying, we apply MIBI, which you also, you know, maybe an INC you're familiar with that on this campus, to the biopsies of our patients. 
You get beautiful images, high resolution, but really the most important part is that you understand the immunological infiltrate of your patient with LCK versus a regular IBD patient. And I won't go into that today, but actually you can see the difference in the percentage of infiltration and the types of cells that are there when you have monogenic disorder versus when you have garden variety IBD. So I will kind of rest it there. That's a lot of work that we're doing there in lupus as well as IBD. Um, and I will show you some fun pictures that we get money to sort of develop this beautiful pipeline where you start with the patient, right? You start with the clinic, you do the genetic studies, you then do the VUS validation, you can do human functional characterization, develop animal models, even a humanized mouse, you move some assays to CLIA, and then um, you get to sort of publish data, train people, practice personalized medicine and save lives. So thank you everybody for your attention. I do, okay. Well, I wanna show something which is, we're looking for trainees in my lab, very much so. So please refer all your great people. Uh, we do all things in Colorado. There's great science, but you know, to everybody that wants to come and train in my lab, um, we got great climbing in Colorado, great backcountry skiing, great 14ers, beautiful rafting. So please come and do fun science and do fun work. In my lab, we have a requirement of a yearly 14er, so FYI. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the question, if I understood it correctly, is uh, you, you're wondering about gamma deltas in the gut uh, that uh, are they, what do they look like in an LCK immune? So we have gotten that question many times. Um, I did not have a antibody specifically for gamma delta. But I don't. But one thing is that the cells are primarily made IL-17. We're actually CD3 positive and um, double negative CD4, CD8. We have a big suspicion in the human. I didn't show that data. There's actually increased gamma delta T cells. So we think that in the mouse we will find the same thing, and then the cells are making IL-17. We actually think it's those. But um, I don't have the certain data in the mouse to show you that. Great question. People, this is my Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks for the talk. Is there something unique about the gut in terms of uh, a lack of T-Rex suppression driving IL-17, or would you imagine that you'd see like TH2 skewed responses in the lung, for example, or other places? Like, is this just a general release of the break, or is there something specific about the gut environment skewing towards an IL-17 response? So that's a great question. I think it actually is not um, unique to the gut in the human. So. Um, so in, in a mouse, we have them in an SPF facility, right? So there's also some restraint in terms of infections triggers. But in the human, there's definitely significant inflammation in the lung as well. There'll be kind of what you, what if you wanted to call it something ILD, interstitial lung disease. So we see that in these patients as well. Um, and I think that the imbalance between the functional effector versus Treg is really occurring at every level of like any sort of organ involvement. It just depends what is the antigen and the trigger that occurs at that time. So when these kids, for example, got the viral infections in the lung, it is very likely that that kind of set off significant inflammation in the lung and let the T cell set shop there. Um, we do not have lung tissue from the patients to assess. Great. And if I can quickly ask a second question, um, yeah. if you were to install the uh, point mutation into a fully mature T cell, would you imagine a similar phenotype? What aspects of the phenotype would change if uh, it wasn't at the development stage? Yeah, so we uh, thought about making an inducible mouse model for a long time. And really, that's the question, right? If I can just get my T cells to pass selection and then switch off and kind of basically turn, switch off the wild type and kind of turn on the mutant, you know, what would that be? And the answer is, my guess is that you would actually uh, have uh, start having significant, more significant issues with function at that point that you would do early on. Yeah.
Elena, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, I like to challenge a little bit the interpretation that there are dysfunctional T reg, yeah. um, because uh, I think the data that you have shown would perfectly match with uh, the idea that the cells are indeed hyperactivated. Uh, so that you have, you know, C25 and FOXP3 expression in the yeah. periphery because they are activated cells. Oh, I see. Okay, um, because especially in human, uh, this uh, would be the case. And I mean, in the end, the meaning does not change probably because having dysfunctional T reg or having activated T cells, um, you know, doesn't make any difference maybe in the um, final phenotype, clinical phenotype of the patient, but uh, the interpretation may be different. Yeah. So to make sure I understand correctly, meaning that actually those T cells are not T regs, they're actually just activated T cells. Exactly. Do they express FOX3 as well? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, absolutely, you know, known that especially in humans, okay. the um, the, T, the T effector cells, yeah. uh, uh, transient respiratory C25 and, C, and FOXP3, uh, so the way to distinguish is either introduce the 127 or in the phenotype uh, or to do the TSTR demethylation. Uh, you know well our work um, mm -hmm. with the TSTR demethylation and can really track cells that I are see. lineage committed in the time of okay. TREG, but then in the periphery because of autoimmunity, autoinflammation, mm -hmm. they just uh, have a more effector uh, phenotype. Mm. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Hi, Elena. Fantastic talk. Um, you haven't talked about B cells. In, oh, in your I mouth, know. Right? And here we like to challenge as well, maybe perhaps some of the concept because LCK, for instance, play a super important role in the activation of B1 B cells, which are the B cells in the peritoneal cavity. Mm -hmm. So, to what extent do you think that the defect may also involve B cells potentially to activate the T cells that you show nicely are important yep. for colitis? What, what do you think about that? So uh, John Camber was, is my research mentor and he published actually a paper on LCK and B1 B cells, right? So like I was very well aware of that. Um, so to answer that question, I actually have a, a couple of hidden slides where, um, so you recall that in the tissue, I showed that there were lots of B cells actually in there, um, but there were T cells. And one argument I had, you know, John and I had this discussion, cause right, he's I'm like, you're a B cell guy and your mentee is a T cell girl. So we're gonna have, some arguments here. Um, and he was like, the B cells are a problem. And I said, well, the B cells are there because the T cells are there. So when you deplete, we depleted the T cells, they were, there were not T cells in the tissue, but there were no B cells in the tissue either. And then we actually did a B cell depletion experiment. And when you B cell deplete, so when you T cell deplete the mice, the gut disease gets prevented, essentially don't develop it if you do it early enough. When we B cell depleted the mice, the gut disease just kind of went on. Like it just occurred as it was, you know, to show that I think the B cell dysregulation is quote, a product of the T cell dysregulation. LCK is important for B1 B cells, but I think the B cell defect is not quote, intrinsic to the B cells, is dependent on the T cells, based at least on that data. Um, so yeah, sure. we thought so, about that. And, um... You know, like we've shown that actually T cells, especially T regs, are essential for preventing the production of photoreactive B cells. Wow. So, have you looked at autoantibody production in your patients, you know, and see what's going on there? Uh, we really wanted to do it. I think getting the serum, but, you know, we, uh, I'm very tempted. I want to basically do an autoantigen array, right, with like our serum from the Haitians and really the mice, because I think it's there very likely. You've also seen a lot of the recent data on type 1 autointerference with basically thymic stromal defects. They're clearly thymic stromal defects, not just like t cellulum but stromal defects in these patients and mice is my presupposition. Um, so we haven't looked, but I definitely think it's there. Yeah. Maybe quick, quick, one last one. Yeah. Have you checked air expression in the thymus since you say obviously that there's defects? But... We have not. It is something we've also kind of um, thought about doing, um, but we have not. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
really uh, beautiful work. Um, I'm Michael Rosa, I'm in GI. Uh, oh yeah, hi. So, um, so you mentioned how simultaneously, like you have to, you're working on this. This can take years, of course, and you need to treat your your patients. So I'm curious. I you said you didn't have your finger on the pulse of what happened to these children in in Germany, yeah. but I'm interested in if 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 any of the findings informed their treatment. What was the outcome? And then more generally, yeah. you talked about maybe to look at cell types. Most of our, at least the therapies we use in the IBD space mm -hmm. conventionally are to look at cytokines, cytokine directed, yep. right, and mm -hmm. not necessarily cell type direct. Yep. So how can we use um, immunophenotyping approaches mm -hmm. to direct their, in, in most of these kids where we don't know a genetic defect, even yeah. in the young ones. Now that's, that's a great question. And that really is a lot sort of, um, so mm -hmm. since I had a little time, kind of one slide that I didn't show, right, is, so how do we use this imaging science? So one, we can immunophenotype, but you're correct to say that, you know, really we care, the biologics we have, right, are like, cyto um, they target cytokines. So they target the function. So I think my answer there is two different parts. One is, even though you can infer a lot from understanding, um, for example, uh, if we understand where the source of IL-17 is and who are the cells that make it, which include ILCs in the gut, right, which we don't see in the periphery, I think if you can identify uh, the presence of them and increase, that helps you to sort of try to point your finger at the guilty party. And you, if you know, you know, these type of cells make IL-17 and there's an excess of them, you have a clue there. The other thing I would say is that we actually can um, stain for um, intracellular um, cytokines um, on tissue imaging. Um, so we've had experience doing that. We also can stay from some signaling proteins. Um, it's a little challenging, but we can do that. So I think it's not about just phenotype at the tissue level, but it's phenotype and function. You're also probably aware there are several spatial transcriptomic platforms now. Um, including uh, those that actually do provide single cell levels. So one thing, there's another arm in my lab that works a lot on tissue imaging where we've worked a lot with MIBI, but we also have done work with uh, Cosimex uh, for nanostring, which filed for bankruptcy yesterday. Um, and, <laughs> and then uh, Tenex Xenium. And um, I'm very lucky to work with a competition group. We hold joint lab meetings together where we can actually, we do consecutive sections. You can integrate the data of the transcription of program with the phenotype, with the cell types in specific regions. So then you actually say, well, these cells are here. They are functionally activated because this transcription of program is on. And then that kind of helps you to target. So that's our merger. Um, and we have that work funded um, in chronic kidney disease for kidney with a lot of working kidney. And then for lupus nephritis, I'm looking to get that Fund it for IBD. So if you have thoughts and suggestions, I work with Ed Zodin and Carrie Hall up there. Um, so we've been thinking about this a lot. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, you showed a lot of cytokines, both uh, IL-17, IL-4, yeah. all these things are upregulated. Yeah. Are they being produced by conventional CD4 T cells? And sort of a related question, if you take the few naive uh, cells, yeah. either in the mouse or mm -hmm. in the human, and you put them through in vitro cytokine generation for Th1, Th2, Th17, yeah. what happens? Yeah, so we, um, let me see, for the humans, uh, we didn't do that. With the mice, we did a PMA stimulation, which, you know, it's very general. Um, and two things, Two things I definitely can tell you, and people do this where you can harvest T cells and you add um, uh, cytokines to try to differentiate towards T regs. So we try to do that so we can have more T regs than do an actually live sort of like T reg wild type kind of experiment in vivo. Um, and we could not expand. So that was not happening. Uh, in the co in the context of polarization, if you add a quad supra stimulus like PMA, you can get all cytokines being made. Um, and they are like conventional T cells, but we also did not assess. We didn't have markers in the flow. We did that by flow um, to assess, quote, um, non-conventional T cells, like, for example, mate cells. So in other TCR signaling defects, people have published on gamma delta and mate cells as well, and we did not look for that. 
Um, and then when we tried to polarize them specifically to watch TH1 and TH2, there was some failure rate in the proliferation capacity. Um, so that's what we know. So there's still kind of a mystery of the source, perhaps, of some of it. Yeah. The reason I'm yeah. raising it is that, mm -hmm. you know, it, the next patient, yeah. maybe, maybe you could uh, make an impact on the IBD with targeted uh, therapies that are already yeah. FDA approved. It's absolutely. hard to know, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. It'll be interesting to kind of understand the relative contribution of those cytokines uh, and their cell sources to disease. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think once you sort of change the cytokine environment, um, even the cells that you didn't think were there or functional, it actually changes how they work because you just get a better sort of signaling all around. Um, any other questions? Yeah, when they're activated, yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So we did have, um, I want to say uh, in this human tissue, one stain that we have is F480. I want to say that that's what we use for mm -hmm. macrophages. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember. Um, and I think that there was definitely a significant increase there. But it is also in a lot of, quote, inflammatory disorders. Like if I look for them in my lupus, nephritis, kidneys, we do find that as well. Um, so I'm curious, CDC2s are sort of, um, I think a very interesting degree cell set type that is there after this being ongoing inflammation because of the intent to repair. Um, so um, I was also very curious about that in IBD. Okay, well, I also wanted to say to, to Eric that um, I believe there is a case of CVID from an LCK uh, missense. Really? I believe so. I can find that for okay. you. Okay. So it suggests that there's kind of a graded phenotype, yeah. and yours is in the more severe case. Yeah, I just, believe it. Just so you know that I think that's true. Okay. I could be confabulating. I have to check. <laughs> I think there's definitely a case of CD4 T cell lymphopenia from a missense LCK mutation, not a, not a, not a compound heterozygote. So. The, yes. The okay, yeah. well, thank you so much, Elena, you. for coming and giving such a wonderful uh, grand rounds. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.